G'day AIEMCA, we're with uh, George Sathis, Emeritus Professor from Boston University, talking about the ethnomethodological underpinnings of conversation analysis. Okay, George. Okay. So George, um, if, so, so what are the, the ethnomethodological basics and, and how, do they, um, how did CA arise out of that? Well, to me it was the same thing with uh, phenomenology providing a, a basis for the development of ethnomethodology. Garfinkel had read phenomenology. There's a considerable similarity mm. because as phenomenology, you're interested in discovering a phenomenon, not mm. theorizing about it, being faithful to the phenomenon. You follow it wherever it takes you. And you don't develop, you're not interested in developing a theory as, mm. you, as you finish. You, you, may be a dis, you may do descriptive phenomenology you, you may do what I call a descriptive analytic phenomenology, but whatever you do, it's like there are similarities to ethno, because ethnomethodology starts looking for things, and Sachs was quite clear, you know, you can be unmotivated looking, you can start looking wherever you want, and then you simply discover, and you're, in, you're engaged in discovery. You're trying to find and then describe and discover what the uh, organization of the phenomenon is, what it is that makes it uh, orderly, and then you can present your results. So in contrast to a lot of sociology, um, a single case might yield a considerable amount of information because if you can analyze that, you basically are saying, you know, there are other cases, if they are like this, they would have the same structure. So you don't have to have a large sample, mm. as we used to do in sociology, in order to be able to say anything. Mm. So I thought, well, that was, a, that was a plus. And what I found was that uh, in developing, in a, developing research in uh, conversation analysis, as, as the years went on, people began to branch off. They went into departments of communication or speech communication or s other departments in sociology because mm. sociology was never a welcoming place mm. for conversation analysis. As, they, as the field developed and as they moved out, so to speak, they were less interested in the connection, even well, the connection to philosophy had dropped out already, but the connection to ethnomethodology which I felt was crucial. I said, what's, what's going on? A lot of these people are writing, but they don't know that there's a connection, that they're part, there's a history here, and it's more than a history. There's, there's something that provides a, uh, I don't want to say underpinning, but at least it provides a uh, frame, framework mm -hmm. from which you can branch, develop, uh, conversation analysis, because even Garfinkel, as he worked along with Sachs, it was, uh, Garfinkel would say, well, yes, it's ethnomethodological, you know, but it's not, that's, it's not exactly what, he, mm -hmm. what Garfinkel was doing. So, so, you know, he left Sachs, basically. Sachs uh, developed uh, what he wanted to, mm -hmm. went on his own way. And I think they had met for the first time in uh, Cambridge when, um, Garfinkel came east to, uh, he was at Harvard, and I think at Harvard he met Sachs, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 60, 61. And uh, then w they both went to California. Sachs uh, wound up teaching at, uh, I think, UC Irvine. But, when, but Sachs, again, in what he wanted to do, he already had this background as he, as he talked with Garfinkel for a long time, all the time. But as he himself developed, he began to talk about the machinery, the, the way in which uh, the organization, the way in which uh, orderly, orderliness was produced mm. in situ in, by you know, particular parties, et cetera. And, and, but he initially started, because there were no tape recorders at the time, he started with whatever he could find whatever he overheard, what he could write down. If somebody, somebody went by and he heard something, he would write it down. He didn't have it uh, technically in the same way as he did later because the technology wasn't there. Mm. Well, when I met with uh, uh, Sudnow, Sudnow, um, I think it was Sudnow introduced me 
really introduced me to the tape recorder. Mm. And w as we worked together, he came back to St. Louis, or came to St. Louis. Um, we, we worked with a hidden tape recorder. Okay. You bury it into a briefcase. Yep. You had a hole cut in the briefcase where the audio came in. Yep. And you'd carry it into a scene wherever you wanted. All right. And at the time, I kept, you know, I said, well, there's no problem here because what we're looking at is the most ordinary kind of activity anyway. Mm. We don't identify people by name. We're not intruding in their lives. We don't even talk to them. <laughs> you know, you record and you go off someplace. Um, it was when the ins institutional review boards at, at uh, universities became more active when they did then it was very hard to do. You couldn't carry yeah, yeah. a concealed tape recorder. Yeah, yeah. But I had a student at uh, St. Louis who was driving a taxi cab. He took the tape recorder, put it on the seat next to him, turned it on, and left it on. Mm. So it recorded his interaction with the passenger and his interaction with the dispatcher over the radio. Yeah. And he could you know, make, a, make a transcript from that, and we could you know, make some sense out of what was going on. You know? mm. How is he communicating? So anyway, we, mm. so we wrote a paper together on the uh, organization of orders that were went out uh, for taxi cab uh, drivers to find different kinds of places. And um, I had another student at Washington University. Unfortunately, he didn't tape record. What he did was f make phone calls for directions. And he found people listing things that they were selling. So he would call them to talk about what they were selling. Yeah. And he would write notes as fast as he could, and he was fast. And then we, you know, we would look at what he had. And that's, that was when I became even more interested in uh, direction giving. But I felt that there was a base for all of these studies, because Sudnow had had this base, Hensland, I had taught him, and he had a base starting with courses that he took at Washington University. Kozlov also had a base, but he decided that he was going to go off into a, a sort of behavioral therapy, working mm. with kids that were autistic. And despite that, you know, he he knew he knew he knew the history. He knew the way to do it if he wanted to, even though he didn't do it. So he he was um, a, a kind of mixture. Um, what I found subsequently, as I was saying with those who became students and then went out into departments of communication and speech communication or sociolinguistics or whatever, was uh, less of a connection to, back to ethnomethodology. Some of them may not have even known, or they may not know today, of, of how Sachs connected with Garfinkel. So, so what are the, the sort of important ideas of ethnomethodology that um, you think sort of uh, inform a, a, a principle. Well, when, when I wrote analysis. my book, when I wrote, I think I wrote the first book called Conversation Analysis. Yep. I felt that it was still not accurate. It was a study of talk and interaction. So it was interaction analysis that I thought was most interesting. In which case, it, there's a there's a, a long number and a long history of the study of interaction, and even Sachs had started that way. Uh, I think Sachs had analyzed uh, the first five minutes of a psychiatric interview. Or so mm. if it wasn't Sachs, it was somebody else. But there was a re he started with tape recordings in that respect. But he also, he, he was writing on more than conversation when he began. And his approach was, was much broader. The calling his, what, he, what he's written, the lectures on conversation, is narrowing the field. He was lecturing on a variety of social phenomena. It was like, uh, you, you, could, you could title what he did, uh, the search for social order, basically. That's what he, that's what he pursued. But I found that as, as, the, as it developed, uh, the students, and, and some say that Shagloff himself is more like this, are very technically oriented, very proficient, careful in their analysis, but what they're focusing on is a certain, what, transcript recording, a place, a situation, and analyzing that. And then they continue to do that, develop even further. They're not 
trying to bring it into the uh, broader picture, so to speak. Or they may not know the broader picture. They don't make reference to anything that comes prior to that. They're not reading things that came prior to that. Mm. And you could say they don't have to. I mean, because the people that are reviewing their manuscripts are, are publishing them. Their references are there, so you can see what they've what they've written. So I I felt as I read uh, some of the material, met some of the people. Um, there, you know, there were exceptions. For example, Larry Weeder at Oklahoma, whom I knew very well, left the Department of Sociology and went mm. into communication department. Mm. And he was training students there. And he was going to the communication meetings. And he was introducing Ethno and CA there. Okay, well, here's a man who knew that material, had mm. studied with Garfinkel and was capable. But he's only one, you know, and uh, others that have come along may have, uh, as particularly in, in, in linguistics or in uh, various programs in communication, all you need to work on is, you know, uh, the data. You, you learn an approach to how to collect, how to analyze, uh, how to make transcripts. So you, uh, what what the procedures are that you use, and that's all you need to do. And you will have findings, or a finding, or whatever it is that you write, and that's adequate. And I was saying, like in this book, I was saying, well, no, the methodology is much broader than that, and there's there must be a way of, uh, you have to think about that with an ethnomethodological background, so to speak, have that framework at hand, what part of it you draw on or use depends on what you're doing. And I thought that uh, it needed to be said, you know. So in this mm. book, I wrote a chapter on methodology, which I was, tr which I was trying to uh, uh, enunciate that, you know, and say, here's, here's the way to, here's the methodology. And within it are, are uh, segments without explicitly identifying them, which is probably my fault, that come from uh, ethnomethodology as it developed, phenomenology as it developed, um, how, it, how they became modified over time, and what, not only what their history is, but what their analytic procedures were. CA has built on those. Mm. You may even use some of the same ones. You don't know it. <laughs> so I felt there was a kind of intellectual ignorance, if you will. It's like, huh? How, how come you don't know? Well, you're not asked to know it. You're not, you're not examined on it. When we were teaching at Boston University, in any student that had a specialization in, in ethno uh, had to take courses that we sent them to philosophy department to take. There was a phenomenal, phenomenological philosopher in the philosophy department. There was another one in both philosophy and the School of Education. And one was more interested in connecting with the behavioral sciences, the other one wasn't. But by getting that training, student had uh, this background in philosophy and mm. phenomenology. And yeah, we felt that was a plus. That was something that they could utilize and draw on. So we insisted well, on you. So what are, what are some of the key ideas of um, Garfinkel's? Um, I'm thinking about unique ad adequacy and, and, and um, you know, shop floor problem and so on that, that uh, might be useful um, to particular CA studies and um, not necessarily as a, as a carte blanche, but at, the, at, the, you know, at a particular, if it's called on, what, what, what are the, uh, the kinds of ideas that a conversation analyst could draw from the methodology that would um, help their research? Well, I mean, there's one contrast in that you know, Garfinkel might have uh, listened to or wrote down or however he might have collected what people said. I think in his uh, first ex so-called experiments with students, he was tape recording. Uh, but he wasn't interested in doing a sequential analysis mm. of what was happening and how they were speaking. So what he was proposing was that uh, ethnomethodology was looking for uh, social 
organization. It, it came from sociology, it was sociology, and he wanted to get to discover how social order was produced. It was ongoingly produced by the parties involved in it. Well, the people in CA also began to see that. If you look over sequences and you see how something comes to be or has been organized in the course of their talk mm. and how the phenomenon might, might emerge or develop or, oh, okay, that's what it's about. Because part of the problem was, even for ethnomethodology, how do you find another one? How many do you need? And there were questions that came from the main disciplines, and that was one of them. And the, you couldn't answer, well, you don't need a lot. You don't, they're asking, where did you find it? That's another mm. thing. Obviously, the uh, person is involved in the collection. Well, phenomenology had the same approach. Ethnomethodology had the same approach. It's like you try to start without any presuppositions. You start without any general theorizing. You locate something of interest. You find, uh, uh, then you have to find ways that are suitable for studying it. It can't be a methodology that is applied to everything in the mm. same way. It has to be something that's really adequate for this particular phenomenon that you're examining. Very different, very different. So that, uh, that was part of uh, uh, ethnomethodology, but it also had a connection to uh, phenomenology. The researcher, of course, is involved. Mm. So uh, the discipline is something that you have to impose. You have to be able to say, well, here it is. You know, it's not just me saying that it's there. Here it is. It's available to anybody else who comes to look. Yeah. And even you know, Garfinkel did in his way in, in teaching students. Um, they had to discover sometimes on their own you know, what he was talking about. Or he would present, or he would have photographs. And this is what it looked like. This is how it went. Um, I think he was more of a, of a generalist in his own way than uh, Sachs was. But anyway, what Ethno, Ethno provided was an orientation that uh, answered most of these questions about you know, frequency, how the observer was involved in whatever he was studying or not involved, how you start without presuppositions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's a whole host of things. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and, and so going forward, what, what, what are the, some of the um, ways that uh, conversation analysis you know, could inform at the methodology and that the methodology could inform conversation analysis and likewise in, in new work that you're seeing mm -hmm. come up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big, uh, big question. Uh, what, what's happened in some ethno, uh, I'm sorry, in some CA studies has been um, studies in, in workplaces, in particular institutions. Mm. So you get institutional talk, mm. or you get an analysis of how the institution is uh, organized through the talk. Well, it turns out the talk is really social action of a sort. So the actions of the parties are, are over time. Uh, and working, you know, in particular numbers, which you may not directly study, but you really should, they're working to have this institution be what it is. They're, they're putting it together as they go along. Of course, you, you find that in what they're doing, they, they may have started with something because they're already at the very start of their own interaction um, drawing on uh, that knowledge. Okay, you can ask, how is that demonstrated in what they're saying? It can be demonstrated very easily, very quickly, you mm. know, by just the way you answer a telephone. And I think the studies of work and of uh, institutions began to reconnect to sociology. Sociology criticized conversation analysis for uh, not studying the kinds of phenomena, particularly social structures, which mm. meant oftentimes institutions. And it was, you know, people could re reply, as I did at one time, well, of course we're studying social structure, you know, the structure of the conversation, mm. the weight of structures of interaction. 
no, that's not what we meant. You know, we mean social structure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a you have an idea about what it is. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not studying that, then there's something wrong. You know. Yeah.